our first speaker today is Matthew, who is from Vero, which is the voice for ethical research in Oxford. So a big welcome for Matthew, please. We can't know how many animals it is that we're remembering today in all the world's laboratories. A calculation made a few years ago suggested 118 million. Well, no doubt it's far more now. And anyway, that was only the vertebrates, the animals we choose to count. The mice, the birds, fishes, cats, pigs, sheep, ferrets, monkeys. It's a big enough list. But there are many other sorts of animal slaves to science, unregistered animals, species whose names we may scarcely recognize. But there is this one thing that we do know about all of them, the thing they do all have in common. They were all born with the will to live and to flourish in their own ways just as we were in ours. It's what we may take that ancient Sanskrit teaching to mean when it says, Tat Twam Asi, where you see life, that is you. That's a spiritual way of putting it, no doubt. But it's a plain fact also. And the great scientist, Charles Darwin, presented it as such in the mid-19th century, when he showed that all life is one great multifarious will to flourish. The mid-19th century. Therefore, the whole filthy modern history of vivisection, beginning as it did in Europe at about that time, has been carried on in full awareness of that fact. All life is one. That's how it was put by the person whose birthday on the 24th of April is commemorated by World Day for Animals in Laboratories, Hugh Dowding. And I'd like to say something about that most remarkable man, Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding. The man who directed the RAF's fighter command during the Battle of Britain in 1940. The man who is therefore to be credited with preventing the defeat and invasion of this country at that time. Here was a person answerable for the fate of countless humans at a critical moment in human history, answerable in particular for the young fighter pilots who risked dreadful injury or death in the sky. And it was known that he did feel very great care and concern for the welfare of those men. After all, one of them was his own son. So did he therefore come out of that war believing that there's a special sanctity in our human life, some special entitlement that obliges all the other animals to serve our interests? On the contrary, he expressly objected to the use of animals in defence research at Porton Down and at Harwell. Not just was it cruel and futile, he believed that all vivisection actually promoted war. And this is what he said. Failure to recognise our responsibilities towards the animal kingdom is a cause of many of the calamities which now beset the nations of the world. 
nearly all of us have a deep-rooted wish for peace, peace on earth, but we shall never attain to true peace until we recognize the place of animals in the scheme of things and treat them accordingly. I'm just going to have a drink of water if you'll allow me. That was Hugh Dowding. And he said that in the House of Lords because he'd been made Baron Dowding in 1943 and he used his time in the House of Lords again and again to present the case for animals. Animals in circuses, animals in slaughterhouses, animals on farms, but especially animals in laboratories. And probably the House of Lords has never before or since heard such plain speaking on that subject. At the beginning of one of those debates he said this, the process of preparing this motion has been a most painful one to me because it has compelled me to read of many cases of revolting and sickening cruelty. And he went on to describe some of those cases to their lordships. Cats at the Royal Naval Laboratory made to breathe 100% oxygen until they convulsed and died. Monkeys at the Lister Institute infected with rabies. The joining together of rats as Siamese twins. That last one was being carried out at this university, where Dowding was astonished by what he called the callous attitude of the people and also the absolute uselessness of some of the experiments. Well, no doubt things have changed. Perhaps there are fewer uh, useless experiments nowadays, here at least. But it was never Dowding's aim to make animal research more strictly useful. Here's what he said on that point. I want to make clear at the outset my own personal opinion. It is this, that even should it be conclusively proved that human beings benefit directly from the suffering of animals, its infliction would nevertheless be unethical and wrong. <laughs> Yes, unethical and wrong. And not because we're animal lovers. We may or may not love animals, so very much the better if we do. But that's beside the point. What we know is that they are life as we are life. They value their part in life as we value ours. And they have as much right to it as we have to ours. <laughs> Well, that's what it means to say all life is one. We know it to be a factual truth. Science itself has told us so. Well, let science practice what it teaches and give our fellow creatures their own lives back. Thank you.